Bonjour. Good morning. Alors, aperçu, um, so to give pour, a pour brief overview of where I'm going to go today, I'm going to talk to you first about ce ce what cyberspace is and why it matters for African security. I'm going to give you some concrete illustrations and examples of five cyber-related threats. I'm going to talk briefly about some of the implications of those threats and response. So start off. So what is cyberspace and why should you care? Um, the answer to this question is, after all, not obvious. You can't touch cyberspace. You can't taste cyberspace. To date, cyber attacks have rarely, if ever, resulted in physical harm or injury. So again, as security sector actors in a region of the world where less than 50% of your citizens have internet access, why shouldn't cybersecurity and cyber defense be a question for IT engineers or economists? My answer to this question uh, is simple. The spread of information and communications technology has already led to a fast evolving array of security threats that every one of you should be concerned about and over the long term is likely to have just as significant strategic consequences for geopolitics, conflict, and warfare in Africa as the horse, the firearm, or fossil fuels. So the main reason why this isn't so widely recognized is we live in an era where digital technology is still very young and rapidly maturing. Um, it's not doesn't make much sense to assess uh, the overall strategic significance of a firearm, for example, by comparing a matchlock rifle to the longbow. The longbow was, in many cases, a superior weapon. But we've had now close to 500 years in various evolutions of the firearm. But digital technology is young. Um, the computer was invented a little less than 70, a little about 70 years ago. The internet, 30. Uh, the mobile phone, 15. Uh, artificial intelligence that can pass graduate level exams a couple months ago, right? So we are still in very, very early days when it comes to thinking about the spread of digital technology. So I'm going to begin my talk with, first of all, a brief definition of what cyberspace is, and then a brief consideration of three broad strategic implications. So next slide. So, uh, the first and foremost, most straightforward way to think about cyberspace is as the spread of information and communications networks. Um, one of the readings cites the Geneva Center for Security Governance, which defines cyberspace as an environment created by both physical and virtual components where data, information, or communication is stored, modified, or exchanged. And I think what's important to recognize is that, sure, well, when we think about cyberspace, we think about this world of networks, this virtual reality that, that, that sort of some seems present doesn't necessarily exist. But it also includes the physical infrastructure and human users, which are also critical actors and elements of cyberspace. So now, can we also, one, one more click on, on the slides, please. Um, when we think about, keep going, when we, when we think about um, threats and vulnerabilities, there are three aspects I want to highlight. Um, so first of all, all computer networks are, are vulnerable, and they're vulnerable in very technical ways. They're vulnerable to attacks that compromise the confidentiality of computer, of data stored on computer networks. So thinking of things that like steal your passwords, for example. Um, they're vulnerable to attacks that compromise access. So when you shut down physical network infrastructure or use what are known as denial of service attacks to prevent people from accessing the website, those are attacks that deny access to computer networks. And they're also vulnerable to manipulation, the manipulation of data or the integrity of data on the network. When you install malware that deletes files or manipulates them, those are what are known as violations and integrity. And these violations and confidentiality, integrity, and access are known as the CIA triad, and they make the core of what cybersecurity experts and professionals consider to be their work. So cybersecurity is a very, very important vulnerability field that has arisen because of the spread of cyberspace. Um, but I would argue that the strategic implications 
of the cyber domain uh, uh, spread, spread far beyond the realm of cybersecurity. Cyber cyber and this is because the spread of computer networks themselves are changing our social fabric. Think about the human element here, right? Um, the spread of global telecom communications networks and computer networks, the internet and social media, have basically combined two major 20th century inventions, the telephone and the television, such that anyone connected to the internet anywhere can instantly communicate with anyone with an internet connection everywhere. And this vastly increases the ability of actors of all kinds to spread and manipulate information. Um, so that's when we think about information security. And a final way to think about the strategic implications are, of cyberspace are less in terms of the networks themselves and more of the specific types of technology that they are enabling. Um, cyberspace information technology is known as an enabling technology. It's an invention that also enables other inventions. And so when we think about some of the, some of the other types of inventions that cyberspace has enabled, we have to talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning. We have to talk about, as my colleague mentioned, unmanned systems and drones. We have to talk about cubic satellites. And these things, as they diffuse, as they spread, are beginning to fundamentally change the global distribution of power in really transformative, really disruptive ways. So I hope that I've at least convinced you a bit of the kind of broader strategic significance of cyberspace and cyber threats. Now it's time to get concrete. So what does this mean right now for you all as African national security actors? I would argue that there are at least five different types of threats we should be concerned about. Next slide. Next slide. So, next, so this is, these are the five. We can come back to them at the end. Um, next slide. First and first, first one is organized crime or cyber-enabled crime, probably the threat that you are all most familiar with when you, when you hear your colleagues talk about cyberspace and cyber threats. Um, I would say that cyberspace is changing the business and practice of organized crime in Africa and globally in three ways. Um, it's leading to entirely new forms of crime, mainly that commit fraud and extortion. Um, it is also changing through the, through the spread of social media, the networks and markets involved in more traditional organized crime, like drug trafficking, arms sales, human smuggling. And it's also creating changes in how organized criminal networks all over the world seek and access finance. And, you know, just to get a sense of how rapidly these kind of threats have grown and spread, um, there was an observation made by an Ivarian colleague in a webinar we had a couple of years ago where he observed, you know, um, in, in Cote d'Ivoire in the 1990s and early 2000s, we were really concerned about in-person bank robberies. Like, that was arguably the biggest threat that our financial sector faced. Uh, you know, 20 years later, we don't have in-person bank robberies anymore because the number of mobile money accounts in our country uh, vastly outnumber brick and mortar bank accounts. So basically the entire industry of fraud and extortion, um, theft, money laundering uh, in Africa and across the globe is starting to move online. Cybercrime is now a multi-trillion dollar uh, industry. And you know, in Africa there really aren't great assessments of, of how large the scope and the scale of the threat are simply because a lot of instances just go un unrecognized or, or unreported, but it's in, it's in the very least the billions, probably the tens uh, billion, of billions of dollars. Um, second threat, next slide, comes from critical infrastructure sabotage. So it's possible, as I mentioned earlier, to use malware to attack the integrity of information within a computer network, leading to physical destruction. Um, one of the most significant threats right now comes from a type of malware known as, as ransomware, which is really, really destructive because it's so widespread. And what, what ransomware does is it, 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 is it, it cry, tries to extort, extort a victim by encrypting the content of a network, which, when it hits critical infrastructure, can have potentially devastating consequences. Probably the most strategically significant uh, instance of cyber-enabled sabotage in Africa occurred in 2021 when uh, an Eastern European-based cyber criminal network compromised uh, South African state-owned 
the port, uh, port authority called a transnet. And the, 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 the attack compromised specifically the port navigation software that transnet used to control containerized shipping coming in and out of uh, the port of Pretoria, I think elsewhere across southern Africa. And it brought containerized shipping to a halt, a halt um, for, across the entire southern African region for 10 days. Um, Cause uh, probably in the tens of millions of dollars in damages, according to one uh, uh, economic estimate I read, that had the had the systems lain down for even a, a week or two longer, you could have been looking at percentage points uh, shaved off the regional GDP because the, because of all the port traffic passing through passing through that region. So this is again only going to be only going to be a third threat. Next slide. Uh, comes from uh, espionage and surveillance, um, which is where malicious actors use malware or create back doors into a network's physical infrastructure with the intention of stealing sensitive information. Um, you know, I think we've seen many ways in which the spread of cyberspace is fundamentally transforming the business of intelligence uh, from not just malware, but also the proliferation of surveillance technology and open source investigation techniques. Um, information is just more readily available to actors of all kinds now than it was even five years ago. Um, Probably to date, the most publicized espionage concern in Africa have been China's attempts to leverage its status as a supplier of physical and network infrastructure to hack and spy on the African Union. But I actually think the story of the next decade is going to be more about the spread of these kinds of intelligence capabilities all over the world and to Africa itself. Um, recently, you might have read headlines about the spread of a malware known as Pegasus, which is a type of malware that basically enables the attacker to compromise somebody's phone without so much as a click. Um, uh, due to uh, a forensic analysis conducted by the independent group that, that broke the story here, found that 600 of the 1,000 phone numbers they were able to identify compromised by the software weren't just uh, activists or civil society folks, which was the main news headline, but belonged to government officials, cabinet secretaries, heads of state, um, including a number uh, in Africa, this chart shows you, I think, what we knew in no, uh, October or, or September of, of um, 2022 about the, the, the extent of Pegasus infections across Africa, and you'll notice that a number of African countries were both infected by and known users of this type of malware. And again, Pegasus was only one type of malware among many other kind of types of malware. So you kind of do the math in about in how, this, how this software is already kind of of proliferating de and spreading. On, on qu'il y avait un certain Fourth nombre de pays en comes Afrique from qui what I would call uh, cyber enabled logiciel malveillant sur leur téléphone. Et ce so as we've talked a little bit about, beaucoup. I think, in this session on conflict et and terrorism, um, point, information technology and social media have changed how Alors, violent armed actors recruit finance themselves, uh, organize, and commit violence. I would say this is true both for state and insurgent groups. Alors, and I think parle, in many respects, you know, technology and information uh, technology uh, is, is kind of a double-edged sword. Um, Al-Shabaab is a really, really good illustration of this, where uh, in the early 2000s, 2010s, it was one of the first transnational terrorist groups to actually get on Twitter and start using it. It used Twitter to a pretty devastating effect to live tweet its account of the 2014 Westgate Mall attack in Kenya um, and really kind of made hay with that, with that story. But what wasn't covered so much and only came out, I think, in, in more towards the end of the, of the decade was that after that happened, um, governments and international actors recalibrated and began monitoring the uh, al leadership using their internet connection to the phone service and was able to conduct a campaign that, that, that um, killed a lot of them and caused them to briefly ban the internet throughout much of their territory. So I, I think one, one takeaway here is that just like uh, physical battle spaces, uh, virtual battle spaces in, in times of armed conflict are contested spaces. Um, we've also seen this, I think, with the recent emergence of drones, um, both of the commercial and off-the-shelf variety. Um, you know, prior to the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, it was actually donc, a conflict in Libya that was the world's most widely recognized drone theater. And 
allegedly, the world's first use of an autonomous weapon occurred in the battlefield in Libya when a Turkish-made drone um, belonging to the, the Tripoli-based forces allegedly um, used AI-driven image recognition technology to engage retreating logistics forces belonging to a Haftar-aligned group and engage the targets without direct oversight by a human user. And this, this capability is, again, it's, it's not theoretical, it's already here, it's already proliferated. Uh, um, a fourth and a fifth and final threat I would like to highlight. Um, next slide, please. Um, is the threat from, from disinformation. That's uh, my colleague Mark, who's moderating the session, is our expert. In. And um, you know, unfortunately, the human brain and today's global information networks are wired such that bloody, galling, surprising, and deceitful narratives spread faster and farther than those that are reasoned and evidence-based. And this makes it really easy for malicious actors, be they politicians, multinational corporations, terrorist groups, or nation states, to spread compelling, yet often verifiably false narratives that stoke divisions, violence, conflict, and corruption. And these can have deeply, and I think arguably already have had, deeply destabilizing uh, external consequences. Um, and according to some research that we've done, it has actually so far been actors external to Africa that have been the, the first and kind of the best at leveraging some of these disinformation uh, campaigns. There was analysis again conducted by my colleague Mark that, that looked at all publicly known disinformation campaigns we were able to identify in Africa. Um, over half of them originated from sources external to the continent, and 60% of those were, uh, were implemented by Moscow, who was the largest single purveyor of disinformation. And the, the narratives they were, they were, they were pushing were typically aimed at propping prop up isolated regimes beholden in other ways in Moscow. So, before I turn things over to my colleague, Hanana, what are the, the three kind of big takeaways I'd like to get out um, So, next in the final slide. Um, so, three, these, these threats were, were in early days. Um, these threats are only likely to accelerate. Right now, between 30 and 40 percent of the continent has internet access. Um, up from basically nothing in early 2000. By the end of the decade, that is going to be more than half the continent, possibly as much as 75 percent of the continent is going to have internet access. And not just is internet access going to increase, but the technology is going to continue to change and in new and powerful ways. Um, a second kind of takeaway for you all is that um, these sort of unconventional threats, these virtual threats, require somewhat unconventional responses, especially from security sector actors. Um, cyber threats aren't just non-traditional because they're virtual, but they, they challenge boundaries and, and, and responsibilities. Um, and the only way to effectively confront them is to is cooperation and trust. Um, civilians, rather than the, the military officials, often make a country's best cyber warriors. Um, when it comes to things like protecting a critical infrastructure, which the private sector often owns, um, you need someone from the government who's able to effectively help foster trust and collaboration between the private sector and responsible uh, for les, the day-to-day -day cyber defense of those assets. Ensemble, that, that, that actor isn't always uh, a uniform security uh, sector. Des um, so um, we're going to talk a lot more about the responses in the next talk uh, from my colleague Anna, who has been working on these issues for a long time. Uh, il but, faut but I'd like to just kind of close by, by reinforcing to all of you that I think Africa is really at a critical juncture and needs to take cyber threats seriously, avec, uh, especially uh, national security sector ce sujet très And I, to, to be fair, I actually Mais do think that there have been some quite oppressive policy achievements on cybersecurity in Africa that go under-recognized. Uh, um, the policy frameworks that are being pushed by the AU and some of the MECs are uh, you know, among sérieux, the most sophisticated of any regional actor or organization in the world. Um, the the Malibu Convention, which is one of the main international instruments that have been developed by Africa, 
Américains en Afrique qui ne sont pas une thèse déroutée. Par exemple, certains efforts de l'Union africaine et certaines des CES ont aussi des réponses récentes. Il y a des challenges. 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 Il y a